Can you think of a time when you were wrong? I want you to think. Take a few seconds. Can you think of a time that you were wronged actually? Or can you think of a situation when you did the right thing, right? But wrong was done to you. Take a few moments. Is there one situation suddenly pops up in your mind? I want you to take a moment and think. Perhaps the wrong could have been done by the very members of your family. Probably it would have been them that wronged you. It could be your friends or your colleagues who wronged you. It could be your very leaders who wronged you. It could be your neighbors. And I then want you to think of this question. How did you respond in that particular situation? When you were wronged, how did you respond? What was your response? I believe by now you would have at least thought about that one situation or that one thing would have popped up in your mind and said, well, you know, it's probably been buried there. It's been kind of kept in there. I believe the Lord wants you to think because he wants you to address it. So how did you respond? What was your response at that situation? Did you start to grumble? How many of you grumbled? Did you get upset with that family member? Did you get angry with that friend who did you wrong? Or did you seek to justify yourself? Or for others, probably you tried to defend yourself. What did you do? That's a premise for our message this week. In the story, we're going to read about two men, Paul and Silas. And these men experience what you probably have experienced, what I've experienced, or something that we will experience in the coming days. A great deal of wrong was done to these people, Paul and Silas. And that's what we want to discover. What is it that was done that was wrong to them? When they were trying to do the right thing, wrong was done to them. But the most important thing we want to learn from their lives is how did they then respond to the wrong that was done to them? How did they respond when they were mistreated? And I believe we need to take these lessons into our lives so that we can address those situations in our lives that we have either conveniently put under the rug or conveniently decided to turn a blind eye towards or not address it. The Lord wants us to address those situations in our lives. So that we may live in the freedom that Christ has really given us. Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And they were in the city called Philippi. It was a leading city and a Roman colony. The question we need to ask ourselves is, why were they in Philippi in the first place? And that's where we pick up our story. Acts chapter 16 Verses 16 to 18. Please follow with me in your Bibles. I will read it from mine. Once when we were going to the place of prayer. We were met by a female slave. Who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting. These men are the servants of the most high God. Who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Paul and Silas were in Philippi. And their purpose in being there was not to take a good trip of the city and this Roman colony. It was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people of that city. What were they doing there? They were praying with people. They were delivering people from bondage. They were obeying what Jesus had commanded them to do. They were doing, as many of us would say, the will of the Lord. They were there in that place doing the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how is it they were treated? Here they are trying to bring the message of hope, the message of love, delivering people in the power of the Lord, 
And how do you think they were treated? Acts 16 verses 19 to 21 tells us, when her owners realized, the owners of the, the slave girl, who was actually, you know, the one who was running after them, when the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. How were they treated? Let's figure out some of the ways as to how Paul and Silas were treated, rather mistreated. First and foremost, you'll find that they were falsely accused. So false accusations. The real reason for the slave girl's owners was that they had lost their source of income, as you read. They had lost their source of income, and that made them angry and upset. But when they brought Paul and Silas before the magistrates or before the authorities, right, they did not talk about that particular thing. Instead of saying that, they accused Paul and Silas of actually causing the city to be in an uproar because of what they were doing. They were upsetting the, the status quo in the city. Not only that, they accused Paul and Silas of proclaiming customs that were unacceptable to them and unlawful to them as Romans. Now, remember, Paul and Silas were also Roman citizens. And here they're being accused of actually, you know, kind of disturbing the peace of the city by proclaiming customs and actually talking about things that are unlawful for the Romans. We know as we read, these charges were absolutely not true. They were being falsely accused. And as we look into our own lives, and we think about that situation, or that particular incident, or that particular time in your life, you will also see that you are also falsely accused. Many times we are also falsely accused. That's not true, you will say. What you say is not right. This is not the way it is. So one of the ways things start to actually open up is false accusations. Isn't it? Hallelujah. I don't know if I'm resonating. Right? And then when we are accused falsely, we will get into that cycle of defending and justifying. Trying to say, well, that's not what I said. That's not what I did. But the reality is that you'll find that in life, many a times, you will be accused falsely. That's the wrong that's being done to you. Well, it's not just false accusation, but it's also racial prejudice behind these false charges. There's also that racial angle, the racial prejudice. They say these men being Jews, that's how the verse says, these men being Jews, why were they thinking about these men being Jews? It was basically spoken with a sense of insult. These men being Jews. They were being insulted by using their race. Anti-Jewish sentiment was very high in Philippi at that time. We find that happening all around. In our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our countries, in the world around. You'll find there's a lot of sentiment that's, uh, that's against your race. Against the place you are. Against your tribe. Against all of these things. In this case, anti-Jewish sentiment was very, very high at that time in AD 50 in Philippi. In AD 49, a year before, the Emperor Claudius actually, what he did was he expelled Jews from Rome. So you can imagine, Jews had been expelled from Rome, right? They were, they were, there was no prohibition in them practicing their religion, so to say, but they were forbidden from proselyting Romans. In other words, you can do your thing, but you can't get to these other guys. You can't touch the Romans. That's what they were told. Jewish religion was tolerated. Many of us would have experienced Something of racial prejudice. Perhaps in that situation that you're thinking about. That could have been the reason as well. 
or you come from this particular village, or you speak like this person who comes from this city, or you have this color of your passport, that can become the reason, right? You experience mistreatment or wrong is done to you. So there's false accusations, there's racial prejudice. And to add to that, the rights, the legal rights of Paul and Silas were also violated. Don't we talk about rights? Animal rights, human rights, all kinds of rights. We are so much, it's my right, right? It's my right to be here. It's my right to preach. It's my right to lead. I, why am I not leading? Why is someone else leading? My rights. We talk about rights and rights a lot. And in this case, their rights were violated. Let me read for you Acts 16, verses 22 to 24. Now, these guys have been brought before the magistrates or the authorities, and the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. So the crowd joins this particular attack. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Why were they there in the first place in Philippi? So that they could bring the gospel of the good news of Jesus to people. They could alleviate the situation of people. They could bring hope and deliverance into the lives of people. And what happens as a result? They are dragged, brought before authorities. The magistrates ordered them to be stripped. That's humiliation. That's insult. They're not just stripped, being beaten severely, flogged. And then from there to the prison, thrown into the prison. And they're in the prison, in the inner cell of the prison. And they tell the jailer to guard these guys carefully. Right? Paul and Silas had a right to trial before punishment. They were not given, they had the right to defend themselves before the magistrates. That court, they were not given any. Right? They were physically attacked in a very inhumane way. And just for your information, Romans were exempt from public beatings. So you could publicly beat a Roman. And what happened to these guys? They were beaten, severely flogged, and put in prison. They were locked in the stocks, which was public torture itself. And I believe you may face times when your legal rights, when your rights are also violated. These two missionaries were falsely accused, beaten and thrown into the inner prison with their feet locked in the stocks, without any semblance of a trial, without giving them an opportunity to defend themselves. Perhaps you have found yourself in such situations, or if you have not found yourself, you will find yourself. But you will not be given a, a chance to defend yourself, to put forth your case. People will shut you down. And what I found very interesting here is, Paul and Silas were in the will of God and not out of God's will, even when they were being mistreated and when wrong was done to them. Many times we ask ourselves this question. We say, well, I'm in the will of God. So why is this happening to me? Why are I being mistreated? Why are people doing this to me? I'm in the will of God. Paul and Silas were not out of the will of God. They were in the will of God, but still wrong was done to them. Hallelujah. I hope I'm making sense. This is what many Christians say. Why me? Why was this done to me? I'm in the will of God. I'm doing what God wants me to do. They were also doing that. So what's the lesson here? Simple. You will be treated wrongly. Hallelujah. You will be treated wrongly. 
Why do we always think that we should always be treated right? We will be treated wrongly. They were treated wrongly as well. You may, doing the, you may be doing the right thing, but you may still be treated wrongly. That's the lesson. So you should not be surprised when you're treated wrongly. Don't be surprised, folks, that you're being treated wrongly. You're not alone in this. The Lord does not exempt Christians from this as well. Even when they are in the middle of doing his will and pursuing his kingdom and his righteousness. So if you're pursuing the kingdom of God and seeking his righteousness and doing his will, there's still this possibility that God would allow you to go through such an experience. So some of you are sulking in this experience. Oh, wrong was done to me by my family member. Or something terrible was done to me by my leader. Whatever, so and so. Oh, something very, very bad was done to me. Yeah, I was putting my heart out in the office. I was working hard. I was doing overtime. I was serving uh, uh, the company. And my boss really gets mad at me. And in spite of my hard work, I don't get a promotion. Rather, I get a demotion. Why? Don't think. This happens in the real world. And it happens to every one of us. You will be treated wrongly. The question is, when you are treated wrongly, how do you respond? What is your response? That's the question. What will you do? And as you think about that situation in your life, or situations, or you think about an experience you've had, where you felt you were doing the right thing, but you were wrong. Or you were not doing anything, but you were still wrong. You need to ask yourselves, how did you respond in that particular situation? Paul and Silas, show us four aspects from their lives. You can see four aspects of a right response when a wrong is done to you. You got to learn. How do you respond right when something is done to you that is wrong? Four aspects. I like us to consider it. So four aspects. When you are treated wrongly, keep your joy in the Lord uttermost. When you are treated, this is their response. When you're treated wrongly, keep your joy in the Lord up there, uppermost. Let me read for you Acts 16 verse 25. Remember, these guys are doing something that's in the will of the Lord and good. And where do they find themselves in now? In the inner cell, which stalks on their feet. Right? And look what they do. About midnight, so it's been a while. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. At midnight, wow, what were they doing? Those guys have been mistreated. Their, their backs have been broken open by the flogging, right? They're in fetters. What are they doing? At midnight, when they should be getting some sleep so that their wounds would heal, they are singing and praying and singing hymns to the Lord. That's what it says, wow. Wow. When I read this for the first time, I remember saying this to myself, you know. That is convicting me. There's a conviction in my life. I'm thinking about this. And the conviction is about the lack of joy that I have in my life. I don't know about you. <laughs> right? Today, if the AC doesn't work for five minutes here, I don't know if this is a condition. Right? If the AC goes off for five minutes, not even five minutes, we'll, we'll tend to get irritated. Oh, Lord, what's happening? AC, no five minutes? Okay. We begin to grumble at the minor irritations of our life. The most minor ones. Back, back in our place in the, in the Middle East, in the UAE, right? I find this. I've said this in, to our congregation, many of our members, you know. For five minutes, the AC, the, the, the cooling is not so very good and you will see all the fans come out. Huh? All the fans are going. So these ladies come out with their fans and they're going like this, like this. So I tell them this. From the countries that you come, you don't have air conditioning 24 hours. Right? You're sweating there, all things is okay. 
The moment, a minor thing, oh, you're so used to, oh, you start to grumble, oh, what's happening? It shows a lack of joy. Even at the minorest, the most meaningless of irritations that we have. If we want to glorify God, we must focus on finding our joy in Him. 37 verse 4 says, which is a command, delight yourself in the Lord. We only know the second part of that verse. And he shall give you the desires of the heart and he will give out. We will talk about this. But who talks about delighting yourself in the commands of the Lord? Delighting yourself in the Lord. How many of us delight? How many of us find our joy in the Lord? For how many of us is the joy of the Lord uppermost in our lives? And if we want to glorify God, that's what we want to be doing. For Paul and Silas, this was not a one-off thing. They were in the dungeon, and even the dungeon, if they were able to sing and praise God in that particular place at midnight, in very, very interesting circumstances in their lives, it would have not been possible if this was not a regular part of their lives. Hallelujah. How many of you really... Have no devotional life, a consistent, disciplined devotional life. And all of a sudden you are in a jail cell and suddenly you will start to pray. You won't go beyond two minutes. But you find in the life of these men, they found their joy in the Lord. And no matter what the situation or the circumstance, they could be doing what they are regularly used to be doing. Because the foundation of their lives was finding their joy in the Lord. They had a daily habit of focusing on how great and how good and wonderful God is. And on the many blessings that he daily heaps on his children. Have you ever taken time out once in a while to just sit and just simply reflect? Instead of telling, Lord, I need this, I want that, give me this, uh, let the promotion come through, let the job come through, let my salary go, my pay package go up. Instead of all of these things, how many of you have sat down just to reflect on the goodness of God? Reflect on the blessings that he's heaped upon your life. And you're delighted in the wow, Lord, so wonderful. You've blessed me with so many things already. I don't even need to ask anything. That's what their life was all about. Paul later wrote a letter to this very same church in Philippi. Right? And he wrote the letter from a prison cell in Rome. So he was a prisoner in Rome, of Rome, in the cell. And he wrote to this church, this very church. Okay? Later. And this is what he said in Philippians 4 verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, rejoice always. Now when I think about this verse, when I think, I wish Paul had said rejoice in the Lord. I can handle it. Probably you can also handle it. But he said, rejoice in the Lord always. Now that's the problem. He could say it. Because his joy was in the Lord. What was uppermost in his life was his joy in the Lord. If I were hearing Paul, I would say, come on, Paul, get realistic. This always I cannot handle. Yeah, rejoicing once in a while is okay. But always is a problem. Then he goes on again in Philippians 2 verse 14. He says, he wrote to the Philippians, says, do not do all things. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Wow. Do all things without? Without? Grumbling. And? Disputing. Now that's also okay. I can, all things I can handle. Right? But without grumbling too much? Can you handle? Without murmuring? Without disputing? Without getting upset with God? Without getting upset with people? That's another ball game as well. And I think probably I might say, I don't think this man lived in the same world as you and I live. But he did. He had learned to focus on the Lord. He had learned to focus on the abundant grace in every situation that the Lord was bestowing on his life. And that's why he was able to have the joy of the Lord as the uppermost thing in his life. No matter the situation, no matter the trial. 
We need to keep this in mind. Paul and Silas did not know the end of their story when they were singing and praising God. Did they know what would happen to them in the, mid in the next day morning? They could have been taken and executed. They could have been executed. Or they could have been put in prison there, stay long term in prison. They didn't know what the outcome would be. Right? So their singing and their praising was not based on the knowledge of a happy outcome. Hallelujah. Amen. We can praise and we can sing when we know that the outcome is going to be favorable. It's going to be a happy outcome. But they, these guys did not know what the outcome is going to be. But they were still praising and singing hymns to the Lord. Why? Because their singing was not based on the outcome. Their singing was based on their knowledge of a good and a gracious God. That's what their singing was based on. They did not sing because they knew they would be let out of prison. That's not the reason they sang. Rather they sang because the prison did not matter. Whether they would be put to death or not. That is not what they are thinking about. They were thinking about their good and benevolent father. In this instance, God's will was to send a powerful earthquake and free them. But it doesn't always work out that way, okay? <laughs> You've been praying. It doesn't always work out that way. God's will is God's will, not our will. Right? Many of God's faithful people have died for the faith. There's a man by the name John Huss, perhaps you'd have read about him. He was betrayed and he was burned at the stake. When John Huss was being burned alive at the stake, you know what he was doing? He was singing. How could these people do this? A cheerful and a joyous spirit does not depend on a trouble-free life or trouble-free circumstances. It depends on cultivating our joy in the Lord. The only way you and I, when mistreated, will be able to stand up and have a right response is when we delight in God. When His joy and our joy in Him is what we put up there. When you look at Christians today, sometimes it's disappointing. You'll find most of them are either grumbling or they're discontented. I don't know about you in Sri Lanka, but the people that I've come across, they probably think it's okay to live in slavery in Egypt rather than living with the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord in the wilderness. So cultivating joy in the Lord every day is not optional. It's not optional. It is mandatory for everyone who knows his salvation. So if you know yourself to be a child of the Lord, if you have known the goodness of the Lord, then every day, day by day, you need to cultivate joy in the Lord. That's a beautiful response, isn't it? When you are treated wrongly, Keep your joy in the Lord uppermost. That's the response that we see in the lives of these people. The other thing that we learn is when you are treated wrongly, keep your witness to others in mind. Keep your witness to others in mind. Paul and Silas were not singing so that they could be good witnesses in a difficult situation. They were not singing because they wanted to show the other prisoners, you know, we are good guys. We have a good Lord. That's not the reason. They were singing because their hearts were full of praise to God. They were rejoicing in the Lord. Right? They were singing because of their hearts were full of praise. Of the joy of salvation that God had given them. But the overflow of that worship and that praising 
was witness. They were not trying to impress the prisoners there in any way. But when the prisoners who were listening to them were seeing them, they began to realize that these are people who really know what they're doing. The overflow of their praise and their worship of God in that very terrible situation became witness to others. That's how it should always be. The world around us should see and should hear our joy in the Lord from the dungeon, from the prison cell and ask, what's with these people? And then we tell them, our lives will back up the reality of the message. And that's so beautiful, right? The prisoners were listening to them. They always are, of course. Do you know that? Right? There are many people around. They're prisoners of Satan in the world that we live around. And let me tell you this. They are watching you. They're hearing what you say. They're looking at what you're doing. Yeah, you're wrong. Then they're looking at your response. You can say all the wonderful things. But they're looking and they're watching and they're seeing. And what is your life witnessing to them? Not talking about things, but what does your life tell them? Those who see you in whatever situation you are, do they say, well, what's with these guys? They're different. You become a witness for the Lord then and there. Right? Imagine if Paul and Silas were having a pity party, not a kitty party. Huh? Pity, pity party, P-I-T-Y party there. You know, because, oh, our rights have been violated. We've been abused. We've been treated very inhumanely. If they were having that kind of a party there in prison there, what would have happened, do you think? And if they were so depressed because of what was done to them, they were depressed, they were upset, they were angry, they were complaining, they would have missed the great opportunity for witness. Many times when wrong is done to us, we get into the cycle of complaining and murmuring and grumbling. Either or we are depressed. We just lose all hope. We are just sulking. And what happens? People around you are looking at your lives. They are looking at my life. And when our response is in this manner. We miss the opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ. We can do all the witnessing that's needed. But the witness is important because your witness backs up your witnessing. Your life backs up your message. So focus on joy in the Lord. Cultivate joy in the Lord. You'll be able to respond better when wronged. And don't forget your witness when you're treated wrongly. Keep your witness to others in mind. People are watching. And I heard the prayer that we made a while ago was that this nation, this city, this land would see and understand and come to Jesus Christ. What's the way it's going to happen? Your lives and my lives. Your witness is what is going to do it. Because through our lives, the Lord will actually project himself. The third thing. The third response or the third aspect. When you are treated wrongly, trust the sovereign, all-powerful God to work for his glory. I like to say that again. When you are treated wrongly, trust the sovereign God, trust the all-powerful God to work for his glory. His glory. Not your comfort. Not your Glory. Acts 16 verses 20 to 3, 26 to 34. Let me just read. Please follow with me. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake and that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoner had escaped. Oh, this is high drama, okay? This is a straight flick from an action movie. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights. 
rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Many times you use Acts 16 verse 33 and we talk about it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Have you ever gone into look at the lives of these people? What brought this about? It's important. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. I was just thinking about this. If all of us would have gone through what Paul and Silas had gone through, and at midnight they were praying, what would your prayer be? What would you have been praying? Put yourself in the shoes. Right? Violated. Inhumanely treated. Beaten. Not given the trial to def chance to defend yourself. Now you're in prison for doing something good. What would your prayer be, my dear brothers and sisters, in that situation? I cannot prove it, but I think these guys, or we would have prayed that way. God, get us out of here. That is our prayer. Lord, Get us out of here. I can't prove it. Okay. But I know for sure. That Paul and Silas were not actually praying that way. You know why? If they had been praying that way. As soon as God sent the powerful earthquake. And the prison doors open. They would have said. All right guys. We are out of here. And they would have run for their lives. Because they would have said, God has done this miracle. He's opened the prison doors so we can go. They didn't run anywhere. They were all there. We are all here. They told the jailer. Right? I think when Paul and Silas, if they were praying at all, when they were praising God at night, at midnight, they would have said this prayer. Lord, use this situation for the greater furtherance of the gospel. Because they knew. Could God not have prevented them from being beaten? From being dragged? From being wronged? And being brought into the prison in the first place? God could have prevented it. But did he? No. He brought them there. They understood it. They knew and they trusted God. Because they knew that God had some other purpose in mind. And so he did. And what was that? The conversion of the jailer and his family. Can you imagine? How one mysterious is God's ways of bringing people. And I think many of us have probably experienced that. The mysterious ways how God works to bring salvation to his people. They trusted God for his glory and for his purpose. Whether they were delivered or they died in prison. Their prayer was, let that situation be used for the glory of God. And for the furtherance of his gospel. When you are treated wrongly. Or when. You are dealt wrongly when you've done the right thing. The question is this. Do you trust in a sovereign omnipotent God. Who could have prevented that situation if he had willed. The question is of trust in the sovereign God and his power. Because if he willed, that would not have been done to you. Do you trust in that God? Or will you, are you willing to put your life on the line? Because you know it's God who's there in this situation. He can do what he wants to do. And what he wants to do and all that he does is for his glory. And so that's something that we need to really look at. If you do, then you must be praying. Lord, use this difficult situation for your glory. To further your purpose. Sometimes we are so self-centered when we are at the receiving end. That we forget that the purpose God has actually called us, saved us, redeemed us, is so that through our lives, he will receive glory 
and his message will reach into the lives of many more people. When you are treated wrongly, trust the sovereign God, the all-powerful, omnipotent God. That's the response we see here, right? I like this. Whenever Paul wrote a letter from a prison cell, he said, he did not say, Paul, a prisoner of the scoundrel Caesar. He did not say that way. Paul, a prisoner of that scoundrel Caesar who has put me here unfairly. He said, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. His trust was not in anyone else. And he knew that wherever he is and whatever is meted out to him, the Lord will use for his glory. When the question is our glory and our agenda is to be furthered, that's when the problem arises. But if your life and the purpose of your life is to bring him glory and for his purpose to be actually furthered, then you can respond rightly when wrong is done to you, right? Maybe you're wondering, does trusting God mean that we should never stand up for our rights? Does that mean? Or do we just lay down as doormats and take whatever happens passively? Does it mean standing up for God means we just, you know, abdicate all our rights. We don't speak about our rights. So when you're treated wrongly, know when and why to stand up for your rights. When you're treated wrongly, you should know when to stand up for your rights. And why should you be standing up for your rights? You've got to get that purpose very clear. And let me close the last part. Verse 35 to verse 40. When it was daylight, the night is over. The magistrates send their officers to the jailer with the order. Release those men. So the jailer told Paul, the, jail, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. Wow. Did they go? Verse 37. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, he says. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Wow. Now the officers repeated, reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. They were alarmed. They came to appease them. Okay. In our land, they say vasta, you know, appeasement. And escorted them from the prison. Requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. The same guys who put them in prison, those very same guys, escorted them out of prison. Right? We don't know for what reason the magistrates the next morning said, guys, release these people. Probably they thought the beating and the night in prison would have actually, you know, sent them packing. They're okay to go. But at this point, Paul says, no way. They have violated our rights as Roman citizens. We demand that they personally come and take us out of here. And we need to think, why did Paul do that? Why? Sometimes it's important for us to, when you read your scriptures, to look into it and ask yourselves questions. Why do you think they, Paul did that? He could have left with Silas. They were free. Paul, first of all, was concerned for the justice of all people in that city of Philippi. What these magistrates did to them was grossly unjust. He knew that by making them come to him personally and apologizing and escorting them out of prison, what would happen, you know? That would be the talk of the town. You see these guys? They put them in prison unjustly, they had to come, apologize, lead them out and escort them out. Word would spread. Wow. And it would be a very long time before these officials would ever beat a man without a trial. They would dare not do that. The people would think about that situation, right? Paul's action helped to hold these men accountable to carry out justice for others who would be accused at some time. 
So when, when should you stand up? When you know that when you stand up, that could be a blessing. It could be the cause of justice for many who may go through that same thing as well. The next time these magistrates would follow Roman law. So he was concerned not just about justice for him. That was given already. But he was concerned that no other guy would go through the same situation they went through. And this would be an example. It would be a warning to those people. So when the situation is justice for others, stand and let the Lord help you. Secondly, Paul was also concerned about the future of the church and the gospel in Philippi. Think about this, okay? By making these guys realize that they had committed something which was a serious offense against Roman citizens, Paul ensured that would not trouble the Christians in Philippi. First of all, they understood they're not just Jews, they're Christians. And you can't trouble these guys just like that. And also, if these guys wanted to come back again to Philippi, he knew that these guys would not prevent him. So he stood on his rights to protect the church and the cause of Christ in that city. Right? If Paul had actually exercised his rights, Paul could have had the heads of these magistrates. He could have gone to a higher authority, he could have gone there. But he let their wrong go unpunished. And by his action showed that Christians are not out for personal vengeance. When you are treated wrongly, you are out to get vengeance. It's personal. But you see, it was not personal for Paul. He was not out there because you have treated me wrongly. I must get back at you. I must get your heads off. I must, I must complain so that you're, you are, you're fired from your jobs. The spirit of Christ is to forgive sins committed against us. While at the same time holding people accountable so that they change their behavior. If your objective is personal vengeance, vendetta, getting back at those who hurt you, those who treated you wrongly, you are not operating in the spirit of Christ. So when you're treated wrongly, know when and know why you should be standing up for your rights. Right? So I just like to conclude. It is wrong to act out of personal vengeance, greed, or other selfish motives. Your response should be motivated because you want to further the purpose of God. His glory and his gospel. And by the administration of God's justice through law and government. So, let me just conclude. When you are treated wrongly, keep your joy in the Lord uppermost. Cultivate joy in the Lord. Keep your witness to others in mind. People are watching you. They are hearing what you are saying. They're seeing what you're doing in that particular situation. The question is, do you trust the sovereign, omnipotent, all-powerful God to work in your life and in the situations of your life for his glory and for the furtherance of the gospel? Do you trust him? That he can use that situation where you have been wronged for his glory and you know when and why you need to stand up for your rights. I just want to challenge every one of us that we will really do right when we are wronged. And in doing so, we will really be sterling witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we just rise? So as you stand to your feet, uh, probably I think by now you are very clear about that situation. Probably for some of you, just the one. Probably for some of us, uh, many. You're thinking about the times that you were wronged. But I want you to think today how you responded. And just come into the presence of the Lord. We are in His place, presence. 
and just allow the Lord to just speak to your lives. Through his word he has spoken. Perhaps you can just say, Lord, yes. I didn't, Lord, my response at that time was very selfish, was very self-centered. Lord, when I was treated wrongly, Lord, my whole objective was to get back at the people who really treated me and mistreated me. But Lord, I have understood from your word. That is not the response that will honor you. So if you're here and you are really struggling, I just sense that there are many in this congregation who really have chosen to just, you know, put those situations, you know, like under the carpet, brush them under the carpet. Probably you just, you just don't want to address it. You just have kept it or it's there. They've done nothing about it. And you're just living life. Perhaps even going through the motions of following the Lord. Yet you have not really resolved that those particular situations in your life. Perhaps your relationships with those people who have been at the heart of that particular situation are sour now. Perhaps you're not even communicating. That relationship has been breached. The Lord wants to bring healing into those lives, into those relationships. And the Lord wants to start with you and with me. So just pray, Lord. I will respond, Lord, in a manner that is honorable, Lord. If you have actually done things, said things during those times, which have been really dishonorable to the Lord. You can come before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to set that right. Hallelujah, Jesus. Open a way that, Lord, we can bring restoration and reconciliation into those relationships. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you will, Lord, cause us to obey you in, in what we've heard today. That, Lord, we will want to be open towards reconciliation and restoration, Lord. Lord, for the words that we have spoken. Lord, the rudeness that we have exhibited, O oh God. Lord, the witness that we have, our own witness, Lord, that has, Lord, been put to shame. Father, we pray that you will work to restore those things in the life of your people. Father, build into the lives of your people today, Lord. I would just ask you to just... Commune with the Lord right where you stand. It's not so much the healing of our bodies. It's not so much the miracles that we want to change. The Lord wants to really restore lives and relationships. He wants us to experience the freedom that he actually gave his life for. He set us free to enjoy it. And that's what the Lord really wants to do in our lives. He wants us to cultivate joy in the Lord. That we will delight in the Lord. We will delight in his ways. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for helping us today. Thank you for the bread of life that you have broken into all of our hearts through your servant this morning. Help us, Lord. We are weak. We are broken. We fail many times. And there is so much inside of us that needs your cleansing power. So many wrong ideas that need correction. We need your help. And we cry out to you, Lord, help us, help us in our unbelief, help us in our brokenness, help us in our weakness. We ask you, Lord, that we may be a witness for you every moment of the day. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. And let's... Uh, 
prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's table. So everyone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal saviour, you are welcome to partake of the Lord's table. Matthew 26 verse 26 says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It says here, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples, and they gave thanks. The one attitude that must be there when we are celebrating the Holy Communion is the giving of thanks. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. As we celebrate the Holy Communion, we are looking back to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are also celebrating his victorious resurrection on the third day. We are not meeting together to mourn that Jesus died. If he died and that was it, then we'll be mourning today. We are meeting together to celebrate the fact that not only did somebody who was absolutely wronged, though he was totally innocent, he hung on that cross as an innocent person and the whole world's sins were placed on him. He died, he took it, and then on the third day he rose again. And there's another thing that we remember as we partake of the Holy Communion, and that is the glorious return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that gives us hope. So when we partake of the Holy Communion, we are giving thanks to the Lord for all that he has done for us, for his death, resurrection, and for his glorious return. And now we are going through all kinds of problems and difficulties. <laughs> Maybe some are minor, but we magnify them. Actually, all those things are going to disappear when Jesus returns, that is our hope. That is the day when all problems will disappear. And we give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and mercy for what he has done for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's just give thanks to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord for the word of God. Let's give thanks for the crucifixion. Let's thank God for the resurrection. Let's thank the Lord for his return and let's thank the Lord for his presence in our lives. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. We celebrate the crucifixion. We celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate the hope we have about your return. We thank you, Lord, that you have touched us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Unworthy as we are, filthy as we are, your blood has cleansed and touched us and made us whole. How grateful we are, Lord. We don't thank you enough for it. And we ask you to forgive us for it. And let us always be mindful that you have saved us, Lord. And never ever forget it. And be obsessed with the problems and difficulties of our lives 
which is a trick of the devil to keep us and to rob us from our joy. And Lord, which weakens us rather than strengthens us. And so, Father, we just pray that you will help us to take the message to heart today and to give thanks to you and to praise you that whatever we face in life, you have faced that and worse and much more, and you have risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And your glorious resurrection power is in our lives to help us. So we give you thanks for these emblems of your body and of your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated. Let's be in an attitude of prayer, worship, adoration, and thanksgiving to the Lord. In a few moments, these emblems will be distributed to you. Let me 
And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with us all, now and until Jesus comes again. Amen.